Hello and welcome to yet another edition of A World Panorama. All the biggest international news stories that made headlines this week are coming up in the next 30 minutes. I'm Ashwarya Kapoor with you. Let us begin the program with the top headlines. 49 people dead in terror attack at New Zealand mosques. Attack suspect uh, Brenton Tranant uh, appears in court. Prime Minister Modi joins the world leaders in condemning the attack. British MPs vote to ask EU to delay Brexit beyond 29th of March departure date. Also reject idea of a UK leaving EU without a deal. Prime Minister Theresa May looks to persuade MPs for a third time to back her Brexit deal over the coming days. U.S. regulator FFA grounds all Boeing 737 MAX 8 and 9 aircraft until May at least. This as the regulators across the world ground the aircraft after Ethiopian Airlines crash killed 157 people from 35 nations. Power restored to much of a Venezuela a week after a devastating blackout struck across the country. Normal service likely a long way off. President Nicolas Maduro calls it an act of US-backed sabotage. Critics call it a result of his incompetence. And Cardinal George Pell, sentenced to six years in prison for child sex abuse, was convicted in December last year of sexually abusing two 13-year-old boys in the late 1990s. Pell is the most senior Vatican official to be convicted of sex abuse to date. The top story this week, 49 people were killed and at least 48 others were wounded in shootings at two mosques in Christchurch in New Zealand. The first report of an attack came from the Al Noor Mosque in Central Christchurch during Friday prayers. A gunman drove to the front door, entered and fired on worshippers for about five minutes. The gunman is then said to have driven about five kilometers to another mosque in the suburb of Linwood, where the second shooting occurred. The gunman, uh, who live-streamed the attack to Facebook, identified himself as a Brenton Tarrant in the footage. He was among the four people arrested later and then he appeared in court on a single murder charge. Facebook also removed all the footage from its platform. New Zealand Prime Minister has described it as a terrorist attack and has named it as one of New Zealand's darkest days. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison also described the gunman as an extremist, right-wing, violent terrorist. I'm, I'm not in a position to give any further detail about the individual that's currently in police custody. At this stage, the police are um, continuing to advise uh, those who are in the area to remain indoors. They have said that they could be dealing with other offenders. That's why they, of course, are taking the approach of ensuring people's safety. Uh, and so until uh, people hear otherwise, I ask that they listen to the advice that have been given directly by the New Zealand police. The nature of the crime, would you describe it as a hate crime? And Prime Minister Narendra Modi joined world leaders in expressing a deep shock and a sadness over the death of scores of people in the attack. He stressed on India's strong condemnation of terrorism and of all those who support such acts of violence. In a letter to Prime Minister of New Zealand, Prime Minister Modi also underscored India's solidarity with the people of the country at this difficult time. Meanwhile, the Bangladesh cricket team's tour of New Zealand was called off after the players had a narrow escape from the shooting attack on one of the mosques. The Bangladesh team, which was about to enter the mosque to offer prayers, escaped unscathed. But the situation led the authorities to call off the third and final test match starting Saturday. And on to the other top story this week, a British MPs voted by a majority for Prime Minister Theresa May to ask the EU for a delay to Brexit. It means that the UK may now not leave EU on 29th of March as previously planned. May was forced to offer MPs a vote on delaying Brexit after they rejected her withdrawal agreement by a large margin for a second time and then also voted to reject a no-deal Brexit. May says that Brexit could be delayed by three months to 30th of June if MPs back her deal in a vote next week. However, 
She has warned that extending the departure date beyond three months could harm trust in democracy. UK lawmakers have voted in favour of delaying the Brexit process, acknowledging that more time is needed to break the deadlock over Britain's departure from the EU. MPs approved Theresa May's plan to postpone Brexit by 412 votes to 202. The eyes to the right, 412. The nose to the left, 202. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. May reluctantly agreed to support a delay after the House of Commons overwhelmingly rejected her withdrawal deal earlier this week. This was second time May's deal was rejected. And then British MPs also voted to reject call for a second referendum. MPs voted 334 to 85 against a second referendum after the opposition Labour Party told its MPs to abstain. We've begun to hold meetings with members across the House to find a consensus and a compromise that meets the needs of this country. But the last few days have also put a responsibility on the Prime Minister. First, to publicly accept that both her deal and no deal are simply no longer viable options. I also reiterate our support for a public vote, not as a political but as a realistic option to break the deadlock. Prime Minister Theresa May will now ask European leaders to grant an extension to Article 50, the legal process under which Britain is leaving the European Union. Meanwhile, everything is conditional on British Parliament approving her new Brexit plan when she puts it before MPs for a third time next week. May says Brexit could be delayed by three months to June 30th if MPs back her deal. May is offering lawmakers a stark choice. Either support her now twice rejected Brexit deal in a third meaningful vote next week, dubbed MV3 or face the prospect of a very long Brexit delay, which could stretch far into the future perhaps for a year or more. The House has to understand and accept that if it is not willing to support a deal in the coming days, and as it is not willing to support leaving without a deal on the 29th of March, then it is suggesting that there will need to be a much longer extension to Article 50. Such an extension would undoubtedly require the United Kingdom to hold European Parliament elections in May 2019. I, I, I do not think that would be the right outcome. But the House, the House needs to face up to the consequences of the decisions it has taken. However, May still faces a huge battle. She has to overturn Tuesday's 149 strong majority against her deal. She must persuade 75 MPs to change their minds. More than two years since Britain voted to leave the EU, its politicians are as divided as ever on how to move forward with Brexit. The lack of clarity has soured the moods in Brussels. Some EU leaders have indicated their wariness to grant May an extension or renegotiate her deal. But European Council President Donald Tusk said on Twitter that he would appeal to the 27th EU leaders to be open to a long extension if the UK finds it necessary to rethink its Brexit strategy and build consensus around it. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. All Boeing 737 MAX 8 and 9 aircraft will remain grounded at least until May after the fatal Ethiopian Airlines crash on Sunday. U.S. regulator Federal Aviation Administration says that the aircraft will not fly until a software update can be tested and installed. Sunday's crash uh, shortly after takeoff from Addis Ababa killed 157 people from 35 nations. Investigators continue to work to determine the cause of the crash. It was the second crash involving a Boeing 737 MAX in six months. Number of countries and airlines grounding Boeing 737 MAX 8s. 
in the wake of Sunday's Ethiopian Airlines crash. On Tuesday, India's aviation regulator DGCA also announced that the planes would be grounded immediately for the sake of passenger safety. Since the crash on Sunday, several countries have grounded the Boeing 737 MAX 8 planes, the latest and the best-selling variant of the US-based plane maker. China was the first country to ban the model on Monday. Well, the 737 is absolutely essential to Boeing. It's the backbone of the company's cash generation and, pro and profits. And it's also the backbone of uh, many airlines' operations around the world. You have a 737 taking off somewhere in the world every few seconds. It's uh, absolutely essential to the future of the airline industry and to the future of Boeing. And This was the second fatal crash to involve the new model of aircraft in five months. Ethiopian Airlines Flight 303 bound for Nairobi crashed six minutes after takeoff from Addis Ababa on Sunday, killing all 157 people on board. Another Boeing 737 MAX 8 owned by Indonesian carrier Lion Air went down in October last year, killing 189 people. In both the cases, the pilot had reported difficulties and requested permission to turn back. <laughs> The Ethiopian Airlines aircraft departed Addis Ababa International Airport on Sunday morning bound for Kenya's Nairobi. But the contact was lost just minutes after takeoff, and the plane crashed near the town of Bishoftu, killing all on board. Eyewitnesses said that there was a loud explosion and smoke trailing behind the plane that crashed. The black box data recorders from the fallen plane were recovered on Monday as the investigation into the accident gathers pace, while the search for bodies and plane parts continue. 20-plus meter-long aircraft had been severely crushed beyond recognition, while debris has been scattered across an area of around 10,000 square meters nearby. Rescuers from a Chinese-based company in Ethiopia have been helping with the recovery efforts. Grieving relatives and friends of the victims killed in Sunday's tragic air disaster in Ethiopia arrived in Addis Ababa. The victims belong to 35 nationalities. The United Nations also mourned 21 of its staff members who died in the crash. He was an excellent guy, a very warm guy, smiling, optimistic. Uh, and this is a pity he, he lost his life in this way. Sunday was a very, very sad day for our organization. It's continued to be as uh, uh, we are united in grief, as the Secretary General said, uh, for the victims of the crash uh, of the Ethiopian Airlines flight, uh, in which 21 UN personnel lo uh, lost their lives. Meanwhile, on Thursday, US also grounded Boeing's entire global fleet of 737 MAX aircraft after investigators uncovered new evidence at the scene of the fatal crash. The US plane maker suspended all 371 of the aircraft. The Federal Aviation Administration said that fresh evidence as well as newly satellite data prompted the decision to temporarily ban the jets. The FAA had previously held out while many countries banned the aircraft. We're going to be issuing an emergency order of prohibition to ground all flights of the 737 MAX 8 and the 737 MAX 9 and planes associated with that line. The Boeing 737 MAX fleet of aircraft are the latest in the company's successful 737 line. The group includes the MAX 7, 8, 9 and 10 models. The MAX 8 became a popular new model for Boeing since its entry into commercial service in 2017. 
more than 300 were in operation and over 5,000 ordered worldwide. The Max 7 and 10 models not yet delivered are due for rollout in the next few years. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Power has been restored to much of Venezuela a week after a devastating blackout struck across the country, crippling water supplies and cutting off telephone and internet services for millions. But a swaths of the country remain without electricity still and experts have warned that normal services may not resume for weeks or even months. The government of Nicolas Maduro has blamed U.S. sabotage for the power outage. The nation has been marred in political crisis since the month of January when the opposition leader Juan Guaido declared himself as interim president, forming a parallel government backed by U.S. and 50 other democracies, while a coalition led by Russia, China, Turkey and Cuba supports Maduro. Amid an ongoing political crisis, a huge power outage left most Venezuela dark for an entire week. The power failure left many homes without running water and caused chaos in hospitals as well as disrupting places of work and schools. At its worst, 19 of the 23 states were affected and the capital Caracas was blanketed by darkness. <laughs> The lack of water has become one of the most excruciating side effects of the nationwide blackout. In the capital Caracas, families gathered up all the plastic bottles they could find to fill them with hose pipes at a public park in the east of the city. Others went to a mountain on the outskirts of the city to find water. Long lines of people could be seen walking along the paths, carrying empty receptacles. Meanwhile, the widespread power outage has left parts of the country vulnerable to vandalism and looting. Stores in a shopping mall in the city of Maracaibo had their fronts smashed and shelves bare. La afectación el el local actualmente tiene 270 tiendas comerciales eh, operativas de la cien, de la 270 105 tiendas oficialmente fueron afectadas. Este eh, un hecho vandálico sin precedente. No tiene otro nombre, de verdad, sin precedente. Government said on Thursday that huge power outage has been completely restored. The government of President Nicolas Maduro has blamed the power outage on US-backed sabotage. Maduro government has also asked the country's Supreme Court to open an investigation into the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, for alleged involvement in the sabotage of the national power grid. The US has attributed the outage to the Maduro regime's incompetence. Opposition leader Ruan Guevara says that the Maduro government's accusations of a U.S. cyber attack were absurd. Van a seguir escondiendo al dictador, que saben que no es viable una solución con él. Van a seguir ustedes entonces, si no, escondiéndose detrás del dictador. Even if the power is coming back, the deadly blackout highlights the need for a negotiated resolution of the crisis. The crisis escalated after opposition leader Guevara declared himself to be country's rightful leader. He was supported by the US and 50 other countries that contend Maduro's re-election last year was rigged and that he has no legitimacy. President Maduro then in retaliation in January cut ties with the US and told American diplomats in Venezuela to leave the country. Maduro retains control of the military and other state institutions, as well as the backing of Russia and China, and has denounced Guado as a puppet of the United States. Bureau Report, Roger Sabha TV. In World Panorama, we'll take a very short break. More international news stories that made headlines this week. Coming up ahead, stay tuned.
George Pell, the most senior Catholic convicted of a child sex abuse, was sentenced on Wednesday to six years in prison for molesting two choir boys in an Australian cathedral. Chief Judge Peter Kader handed down the sentence in a hearing broadcast live worldwide from Victoria's County Court in central Melbourne. Cardinal Pell was convicted by a unanimous jury verdict in December last year of sexually abusing the two 13-year-old boys in the late 1990s, months after he became the Archbishop of Melbourne. A court order had suppressed media reporting the news until last month. The Cardinal, however, denies the allegations and has lodged an appeal. Cardinal George Pell, jailed for six years, being convicted of sexually abusing two boys in Australia. Pell abused two 13-year-old choir boys in Melbourne Cathedral in 1996. In sentencing Pell on Wednesday, a judge said that the cleric had committed a brazen and forcible sexual attack on the two victims. The judge also came down heavily on Cardinal's conduct, saying it was full of staggering arrogance. This means that I sentence you to a total effective sentence of six years imprisonment. I set a non-parole period of three years and eight months. That means you will become eligible to apply for parole after serving this non-parole period. The judge also made it clear that the sentence was based solely on the crimes that Pell was convicted of by the jury and was not made a scapegoat for the failings of the Catholic Church. As I directed the jury who convicted you in this trial, you are not to be made a scapegoat for any failings or perceived failings of the Catholic Church. Nor are you being sentenced for any failure to prevent or report child sexual abuse by other clergy within the Catholic Church. In December last year, the jury unanimously convicted Pell of five charges of sexual abuse committed on children under 16 years of age. The trial heard a testimony from one of the victims, the other died of a drug overdose in 2014. Cardinal Pell's conviction has rocked the Catholic Church, where he had been one of the Pope's closest advisers. On the day of sentencing, many campaigners and abuse survivors had come to witness his downfall. Protesters described the sentencing as a victory, as they cheered outside the courthouse in Melbourne. Today is a victory for not just Australians but globally because today we sent a, a message that our children are important and their lives matter and in the future we create good people by treating them well. And these people who call themselves the good and the just have deceived not just us as children but our entire society. No more. Pell, who showed no emotion during the sentencing hearing that ran for more than one hour, has however maintained his innocence and has filed an appeal that is scheduled to be heard in June. It's normal for counsel to seek independent counsel to do an appeal. And what does your client feel about the sentence he was handed? No comment. The verdict was kept secret from the public until February, when additional charges of sexual offences against Pell were withdrawn by prosecutors. The former Vatican treasurer is the most senior Catholic figure ever to be found guilty of sexual offences against children. Last month, the Vatican described Pell's conviction as painful news that had shocked many. He was removed from the Pope's inner circle in December. The church, however, noted that the cleric had a right to defend himself to the last degree. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. And let's take a look at some more international news in Global Buzz. U.S. President Donald Trump has vetoed a measure from Congress revoking his declaration of a national emergency at the U.S.-Mexico border. Lawmakers, including 12 Republicans, had passed the rejection resolution on Thursday in a surprising rebuke of Donald Trump's pledge to build a border wall. Congress will now need a two-thirds majority in both chambers to override him, which is unlikely to happen. This is the first veto of Donald Trump's presidency.
U.S. says uh, that diplomacy is uh, still very much alive with Pyongyang despite a failed summit last month. The chief U.S. envoy for North Korea, Stephen Baigun, said this. However, he cautioned that Washington was uh, very closely watching the activity at a North Korean rocket site and did not know that if uh, it might be planning a new launch. He told a conference in Washington that although U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un parted on good terms after their February summit in Hanoi, big gaps still remained between the two sides and North Korea needed to show that it was fully committed to giving up its nuclear weapons. Thirty-one militants, many of them believed to have been al-Qaeda terrorists, have been killed in airstrikes in southeastern Afghanistan. The strikes were carried out in Ghazni province late Wednesday, where the Afghan Defence Ministry said that they targeted a base belonging to the militants. One of the facilitators for al-Qaeda was transferring these 31 terrorists, including nine suicide bombers in several cars, when they were targeted by airstrikes and eliminated. And China's Huawei Technologies Company Limited has pleaded not guilty to a 13-count indictment filed in a New York federal court against the company. This as the tensions have increased between the US and Beijing. Huawei, the world's largest telecommunications equipment maker, was charged with bank and wire fraud and obstructing justice. The company's chief financial officer, Meng Wangsu, was arrested in December in Canada on charges in the indictment. She has said that she is innocent of the charges and is fighting extradition. The next court date is set for 4th of April. And finally, a pig which discovered a love of painting after being rescued from a slaughterhouse fetches thousands for her artwork. The pig, named Picasso, was saved from a slaughterhouse when she was a piglet in 2016 and taken to an animal sanctuary in South Africa's Western Cape region. It was here that her new owners noticed her love of colour and paint brushes, and the unlikely artist was born. Her paintings can sell for almost 4,000 US dollars with the proceeds going to an animal welfare. She has even had one of her artworks turned into a watch face for Swiss watchmaker Swatch. Picasso's art was taken on a tour last year in an exhibition. Her pieces were shown in South Africa, the UK, France, Germany and the Netherlands. So take a look at this amazing artist as I take your leave. I'll see you next week in another edition of World Panorama. Bye-bye.